so glad that you are here today. Good morning and welcome to Better Together at Gateway. And we hope that t- there's one person excited about that. That's great. We hope that uh, if you're not sure yet that we're better together, that by the time you leave today, you will say we most certainly are better together. My name is Tim. I'm one of the pastors here and we're so glad that you're here today. We are here as a church to help people take a step in the right direction. And you know what? We would love in some way to help you take your next step today, whatever that is. This year at at Gateway is all about creating community. And with our Better Together series, we are really desiring to experience community together and we hope that you are able to experience that today in some way. If you're newer here, we're glad that you came. We invite you to stop by our guest services area in the atrium before you leave today. We have a little Tim's card we'd love to give you and just say hi. And if you have any questions, you are most welcome to ask us what those are. Uh, For our our series, uh, for the next seven weeks, you may have noticed that we kind of converted our atrium into a bit of a cafe. And so we want to just let you know that each week you are invited to come early 
for the second service. If you come to the 1130 service, come on out a little bit early, hang out in our cafe, and I believe we have free coffee for the entire series, all right? So, uh, and I, I think there might even be some cookies or some stuff floating around as well. I saw those uh, today. And so come on early, hang around, and uh, we also have something fun to do. How many of you saw that you had a card on your seat when you came today? Just go ahead and grab that. Uh, and if you need one, if you, if, you, if you don't have enough in your row, then just wave a hand and our ushers will make sure that you get one. They look like this. So go ahead and grab a puzzle piece card. And here's what we're going to do. As we greet each other this morning over the next four minutes or so, uh, what we're going to do is uh, there's pens on your seats as well. I want to invite you to take the pen and I'm going to invite you to write uh, a note of encouragement to somebody, especially if it's somebody in the room, all right? Just a real quick one sentence, you know, note of encouragement to say something uh, to someone, and then you are going to go back at some point, just between now and the next four minutes, you're going to go back, see those boards across the back, there's all kinds of encouragement cards on them already, peel the, peel the tape off the back, and then just stick it on that board, and then take the little piece of paper you peeled off, and don't throw it on the floor, but put it in the little wastebasket right there, uh, is that all right? And then there's a spot for your pen as well, so that you can discard it appropriately, all right? We have an example for you on screen of what those cards should look like, uh, just to say, you you know, an encouragement to somebody. <laughs> they, they can be true or they may not be not so true. No, that one's true. It is true. Pastor Rick is the second best speaker. All right, never mind. Uh, anyhow, um, so take a few minutes, do that, mingle around, say hi to some people, greet each other, throw some uh, cards back there, and we'll be back in a few minutes. Okay, while you're finishing up, we're greeting with each other. We're gonna do a selfie. Okay, so I need everybody to stand up, get in the middle. Come on, we're gonna do a selfie. I'm gonna hold it up right here. Oh, I got my wife beside me, isn't that nice? Okay, anybody wants to get in on the selfie? I think this is the first time in my life I've ever done a selfie. Second time. Yes, oh, second time was first service. I forgot about that. Yes, I am 50 years old. I've never done a selfie, all right? Are you all ready? Yeah. Everybody say better. Together. Here it comes. Oh, it's coming. Is it coming? Yeah. Oh, it's coming. Okay. Wait. It's coming. Oh, I'm holding it now. Here it comes. And okay. It's. Uh, I'm pushing. I'm holding the button as hard as I can. Oh, here it comes. Yeah, the faces. Oh, yeah. Okay. Is it getting the fa there? Are we better together? Woo! 
Absolutely, we are. And we got an opportunity for you to get involved in Better Together groups. And so we want to just let you know out in the foyer today, we've got books and DVDs and opportunities for you to get together in a variety of ways, expressions, however that works for you, into small groups or with one or two at a coffee shop or whatever, to get together in those small groups and just to encourage one another over the next seven weeks. As well, to let you know, tickets for our daddy-daughter date night on May the 13th are selling quickly. I remember uh, having these moments with my daughter, some of the most significant times my girls still talk about. I still remember uh, being with you, Dad. So I want to encourage you, Dads, you do not want to miss this. You'll make a memory with your daughters that will last an absolute lifetime. We're going to invite the ushers to come forward, receive your tithe, your offering, your giving today. We want to give with a heart of generosity. If you're new here today, generosity, we want that to be a marker of who we are at Gateway Church. We know that people are here today and some are having a great time. Others are not having so great a time. So we want to pray for you today and we want to pray that God will encourage you. And some of you are here and you're saying, boy, if I just had Jesus with skin on. In other words, I just, I just need someone to give me a hug. I just, if somebody knew how hurting I was on the inside, we, we want to be sensitive to that. And there are those that were hurting uh, in our family today. And so we just want to pray. So Lord, I just thank you for this wonderful day. We, we, we just praise you, oh God. But we also know that, Lord, for those who are having a great day, there's lots that are here not having so great a day. They're discouraged. They're down. They, they maybe had some bad news this week. Things aren't working out the way they had hoped and dreamed. So Lord, we want to just pray that you will just lift them up and encourage them and strengthen them. For those in our church family that are needing healing, Lord, we think of Kim uh, who's in the hospital right now. Bless her, Father, strengthen her body. Lord, for Ren and his whole family, oh God, it's such a difficult situation, Lord. Uh, Lord, will you just make your presence real for that family, Lord, and uh, strengthen them today. If again, Lord, for those that are here, Lord, would you just lift up their spirits and let them know that they're not alone, that you're here with them. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you in your generosity today. Yeah. 
10 and 6 states that, Lord, there is no one like you, for you are great and your name is full of power. That's Jeremiah 10 and 6. Your name is full of power. And this week as I was preparing for today, the Holy Spirit was speaking to my heart. And I am well aware, and this church is well aware, that there are many of you that will come with circumstances that you feel are dead. There's, it's hopeless. And in Ezekiel 37, it speaks about the dry bones, how they come to life with the breath and the power of the Holy Spirit. And what I love about community is that we can partner with one another, pray over one another, speak into those moments that we feel are dead. But Jeremiah 10 says, how great are you, Lord? Your name is full of power. And I love that we can come together, better together, to speak life and hope into those situations that we feel are broken this morning. So as we sing this song, just know and be encouraged, you are not alone. And we as a community will help speak life into those, into those in situations where you feel are dead this morning.
for singing with us this morning. You can take a seat. Thanks, team. It's an incredible thought to, to think that the very breath that we have in our lungs is because God has given it to us. Everybody welcome Michelle. Come on. All right. I'm going to give this to you. I'm trusting you with it, okay? okay. Is that all right? I'm good. With is that safe? Yeah, okay, safe. good. <laughs> I'll be good. We have invited Michelle to uh, come and talk to us for a couple minutes this morning because um, in the spirit of what it really means to be community and what it means to be better together, uh, many of us have experienced different things in our, in our lives, and I'm going to ask Michelle a little bit about that. And, uh, and then to just tell us a little bit of what she experienced with regard to community. So, Michelle, uh, first of all, just tell us kind of what's been going on in your life a little bit in the last little while. Okay. Um, in December, just before Christmas, a couple weeks before Christmas, um, in all the busyness of life, I was um, carrying some things down into my basement and I missed the, bat the last three steps. Consequently, I smashed my left ankle up and had to have surgery and I broke my right foot. And it put me totally out of commission uh, for quite a few months. That's been quite a journey, eh? It's been quite a journey because I've never been out of commission, really. Wow. <laughs> yeah, and I know what a, um, uh, like an active person you are and how involved you are in other people's lives. And many of us who are here today have experienced the way that Michelle is involved in people's lives. And even from... Uh, on behalf of the music team, we've really missed having you uh, doing our lunches for us. And I'm back today, yeah. music Woo! team. <laughs> That's awesome. And we're, we're really glad about that. But, uh, so tell us um, a little bit more of what you experienced after that, like in the, in the context or the theme of community. What, what is it that you experienced? Okay, well, what I experienced immediately was uh, my church family gathered mm. around me. Um, I had prayer immediately, I knew that, but my wonderful friend Jan Bentley, who's in yeah. our church family, came to me and said, what do you want, what do you need, what can I do? And what I needed was someone to take care of me. Um, my husband went to work during the day, he works out of the country, so to be home, I needed somebody after he left. So she put out a call and I had people scheduled at my house at 2.30 every afternoon. Uh, at dinner time and in the evening to come and get me into bed. Wow. Um, if that hadn't happened, I wouldn't have been able to stay home. I yeah. couldn't have gotten to the washroom. I couldn't have eaten or had a cup of tea. Wow. So that was a miracle. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, that's we call this thing the body of Christ or the family of God. There's different terms that we use. And, and the reality is there are times in which we really do need to be a body, like people doing different functions in different parts just like our bodies do. And we're so glad that you experienced that in a, in a real way, like when you needed it the most. And sometimes, you know, we, go, we just kind of go through life and we don't really think about, uh, you know, how valuable it is to have people in our lives and, and to be interconnected connected and networked well with people. Um, but then when we go through a crisis, especially when we go through a difficulty, uh, we really then find out how much it means to us, mm -hmm. right? And how, how much we value it. That's very true. Um, during that time, too, I had people I didn't know come to my home. They brought me food. They, we were fed for four months. Wow. Um, financially, we were helped because my paycheck stopped and hospital expenses still happen. Yeah. Yeah. The casts are expensive. So yeah. God just sent people. I yeah. even had a situation where Stan and I were talking about a grocery list and we needed toilet paper and yogurt and green peppers. And about five minutes later, Somebody came to our door with a box of toilet paper, green peppers, and yogurt, no and a way. few other things. It was amazing. Wow. It was, it was just amazing. That's not a bad uh, prayer list. Yeah. <laughs> Grocery list, prayer list. It's all the same, right? Yes. Uh, Michelle, one last thing I want to ask you is just what would you say to all of us today about what it really means to be better together? What are your thoughts on that? Okay. Well, being better together is being in an environment where you feel safe and you feel loved and you're able to give love and receive love. And um, that is just a total blessing to be able to receive the love that even strangers give you. And to me, it's just blessings, yeah. blessings from heaven. Yeah. Giving and receiving, eh? Giving and receiving. Awesome. Thank you, Michelle. You're welcome. Thanks for being here. Again. And you know, 
Friends, you may have caught this, but the one thing that we want to say to you is that we hope that you experience everything that you just heard about in every way. I need a water fountain to jump in or something, man. Good morning. How's everybody doing today? You doing good? Welcome to our series, Better Together. Not only is it our series, but it's our year-long theme, and it's our passion. It's our passion here at Gateway. If you're new, it's our passion to, to, to come to grips with the notion that we're better together than we are on our own. We want all of us to become a we. We want all of us to become a we. Each one of us needs to be a we. The we in We Are Gateway. Better together to know and be known by God and to be known by each one and to fit in, to find a place at the table. I don't know about you, but in my house, uh, I have a place. I have a, a spot. This is where I sit at the table. Do you, all, you know what I'm talking about here? You, you all have a place at the table where you sit. That's kind of your spot. Well, I have a spot at, uh, at my place, uh, and I know that you have one too. Well, I remember a number of years ago when Gabby first started dating Sam. Most of you know that he's now my son-in-law. And uh, I remember the first time that Gabby said, Dad, I'm going to bring Sam over supper. Is that okay? And I was like, because I knew where this was going, and, and I was like, okay, yeah, yeah, he can come over for supper. So Sam comes over for supper, and he, he sits <laughs> in my spot. <laughs> the boy, you got five or six chairs around, he sits in my spot. And Cheryl had said to me, now, when he comes, you be good. <laughs> you be good to the boy. I was like, okay, if I have to, I'll, I'll be good to him. But he's sitting in my spot, and I'm like, <laughs> and I don't know what to do with this. And finally, Gabby, so graciously, because she knew that he would soon be eaten, that <laughs> you're in dad's spot. So he gets up and he moves. Guys, if the first time you go over to a girl's house for supper, if you want that first supper to not become the last supper, <laughs> Don't be sitting in Bubba's chair. <laughs> Don't be sitting in that chair. Jesus told a story about this in Luke chapter 14. It's called the parable of the banquet. And he tells a story. He said a certain man was preparing a banquet. And he invited many guests. And at the time of this banquet, when it was all ready, he said, come for everything is now ready. But those who had been invited began to make excuses. One bought a field and says, I got to go look at my field. I can't come to your party. I got to go look at my field. Excuse me. Another said, well, you know what? I just got married and I, you know what? I can't. I'm tied up. I got, yeah, I got things. I got stuff. So he couldn't come. And then another one said, well, I bought five yoke of oxen. I got to tend to my new yoke of, of oxen. And so, you know what? I, I just can't do that. Excuse me. The servant comes back and he reports to the master all of this. And the master got very, very angry. And he said, well, you know what? I want you to go out into the streets. And I want you to gather the poor, the crippled, and the blind. And I want you to bring it here. Compel them to come and to eat. The servant goes out and he, he invites them all in. And he, there's still room. And so the master then says to him, I want you to go out into the countryside then. I want you to go out into the roads, into the country lanes, and compel them so that my house will be full, so that my table will be full. Don't you all want a place at the table? Yes. Yes. I mean, think about it today. A place of belonging, a place of acceptance, yes. where, where you know the people because they're your people and where you are known. I don't know about you, but if, if Jesus was throwing a party and invited you to the table, wouldn't you want to be at the table? I mean, think about it. All of these people were invited to the table and they were so busy with their life, they didn't have time to come to the table. If Jesus invites us to the table, how many think it's important that we would want to come to the table? So I've got a table here today and I want to know, does anybody want to come to my table? We're going to have something to eat here today. Who wants to come to my table? 
We got seats here. Come. Whoever first come for serve. Who wants to come and sit at my table? <laughs> now think about this. The rest of you who did not get up are going to miss out today because I can promise you for the next seven weeks you want to come and you want to be at this table because this table, this table, yeah, this table is going to eat Cinnabon while you all watch. Let that serve as a reminder. <laughs> let that, hey, let that serve as a reminder. When Jesus invites you to the table, you better come. Yeah. You better come. That's what this is all about today. I want you to understand today that Jesus is inviting us to the table every single day, and it's called community. To gather together in community where we can know and be known. Now this past week, uh, I just got flew in yesterday. I was at a conference all this week and it was a, a really unique conference where I was able to be with some of the, the biggest communicators and the best church leaders in North America. And I was there for a week and it was a, it was a smaller intimate conference that I was able to sit at the table with some very significant leaders. So I was sitting with Andy Stanley. I was with Bob Acoff, who, uh, John Acoff, who's on, on Comedy Central. Uh, some of you may know of Lecrae. I was with Lecrae. Just, just saying. Bob Goff, comedian. Like I was with some of the, the biggest names. And I was at this smaller group so that we could have an intimate conversations with these gentlemen. It was, a, it was a unique experience for me because we could ask personal questions. And so here I am at these tables with all these great leaders. And I got to admit to you, I was a little nervous. I mean, nobody wants to ask Andy Stanley a stupid question. I mean, if you're going to ask a question and you're in front of all of the best of the best leaders and you get a chance to ask a question, then you want to make sure that you ask a smart, intelligent question. And so I'm thinking about this, but I don't want to miss out an opportunity. I'm never going to get to this table ever again. So I don't want to pass up my chance to ask a question. So I'm thinking about coming up with my very best question. I'm thinking, oh, he's going to, they're going to, this one's going to be profound. And, and I slowly raise my hand in order to be acknowledged to ask my question. And when I do, it was John Acuff, he turns and looks at me and he goes, hey, it's Tom Arnold. <laughs> in front of everybody. Hey, everybody, look, look, Tom Arnold's in the room. <laughs> Are you kidding me? my one chance to talk to Andy Stanley, and I get Tom Arnold. I was kind of hoping for Brad Pitt. Hoping. hoping. I guess I'll have to settle for Tom Arnold, hon. You're going home with Tom tonight. We all want to be known. We want to be recognized. We want people to know who we are. Social media is constantly pushing the button to be known, to be recognized. That's why we have selfies. That's why we, we, we have Instagram photos. And we measure our esteem on how many likes we get. I've said it before, but we've never had more friends, never been more lonely with more Facebook friends and Twitter and Instagram and LinkedIn or LinkedIn and Snapchat and all these things. And we call it social networking. We get contracts and communities and friends and followers we like and we unlike. We share everything that's on our mind and nothing that's in our heart. And loneliness. Loneliness is the word of our culture. In fact, we were learning this, I was learning this past week that loneliness is predicted to be the number one health issue in the next 20 years. Health professionals are not, they're not looking at cancer and some of these other things to the degree that they believe that it is going to be the number one issue in the next 20 years is loneliness. We are in a lonely world. And this, this loneliness of ours is not a flaw. We aren't lonely because something is wrong with us. We actually are lonely, I believe, because something is right. Something is right with us. 
We were created to be in a community. We were created, created to be in fellowship. Our loneliness is the reflection of our need to be a part of the image of our triune communal God. A God who by very nature of his own makeup designed us to be like him, to be in community, to be a part of something larger than ourselves. C.S. Lewis wrote, To love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will certainly be wrung and most likely broken. He goes on to say that the only place outside of heaven where you can be perfectly safe from all the dangers of love is hell. Real community must be experienced. It has to be created. It's not automatic. It's not even natural to us, even though it's our greatest need. And it's messy, isn't it? Community is messy. It's awkward. It, it, there's a cost that comes to it, and we don't do it naturally. That's why we have to have social dating, and we have to have all these dating websites, because we don't even know how to connect. We have to have algorithms and, 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 and phones and mechanics to kind of help us to find that right person, to connect with that person. There, there is a risk and there, there are tensions that have to be overcome if we are to emerge the truest measure of who God wants us to be. And let's be honest, Jesus came for all people. He came so that we would all be in community. The weird ones, the funny ones, the quirky ones. And while you might have someone in mind when I say weird or quirky or funny, please understand, someone else has you in mind as quirky or funny or weird. But you can't, and this is the point of this entire series, you can't be the best you by yourself. To believe that you can be the best you by yourself is to believe the greatest lie of the enemy. You can read all of the self-help books, listen to all of the blogs in the world, but you can't do it. I'm fine on my own. I don't need anybody's help. I'm a self-made man. I'm a self-made woman. I, I don't need anyone to become my best me. I can manage. Oh, no, no, I'm good. How you doing? Oh, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Liar. <laughs> Liar. And when life is coasting along, that's when we're tempted most to believe it. When life is good. Pastor, oh, eh, you know what? Lonely people, losers need community. I'm good, Pastor. I'm great. I, I'm, I don't need to belong in a group. I don't need friends. You know what? I am good by myself. I, I can get tempted to think that being who I want to be and getting what I want out of life is more important than who I am to become. And that what others are and what they need has no bearing on my joy or happiness. I want you to know it's wrong. To come to the conclusion that we is more important than me is the goal. That we can connect together. That we learn together. That we grow together. That we serve together, that we play together and dance together and laugh together and cry together, that we become better together than we can be our own. These are some of the greatest truths that if you get it in your spirit, your life will be all the richer. Paul, who wrote to the church in Rome several years after Christ rose from the grave, he wrote these words. He said, since we are all one body in Christ, we belong to each other. And each of us needs all the others. Remember that when Jesus Christ created all of this, God did not do this to create an institution. One of the greatest fallacies when people look at the church or religion or anything to say this is an institution. Jesus did not come to create an institution. If he had done that, then all he would have had to done is send a parchment of rules and regulations. All he would have had to do was to set a list of guidelines, which is what most people think about our Christian faith. This is not what God sent. When God went to descend what he wanted to create, what did he send? He sent a son. He sent family. When God created the church, he sent family so that we could experience family here on this earth. And in this series, before our summer gets, gets going, we're going to focus on some of the greatest lessons that we could ever learn about what it means to be a part of community. We're going to learn how to love. We're going to talk about why relationships go bad. And how do you turn a bad relationship into a good one? And what is it that God does when he uses other people in our lives? And why is it important for us to become interdependent and not independent? 
And how does he do it to make us what he wants us to be? So today I want to give you a little introduction about that. I, why we need each other and why we need God's family. When I meet God's family, I understand I'm also not talking about the Sunday experience. Some of you say, well, I'm here and I'm part of this community. This is not community. This is a crowd. Right. This is a crowd. Now, this is a community uh, of, of a crowd, but this is a crowd. If you come here, and I say this over and over and over again, if you come here Sunday after Sunday and you think you're part of a community because you're here in this big room, you're going to be sadly mistaken when you break both your legs. I can tell you this, that what happened, what happened to her and how her life was completely turned around, Michelle's life was turned around, not because she was part of this, but because she was part of this. She was part of community. And so I want to look at some of the reasons of why we need to be part of community today. Number one, we need others to walk with us. I need people to walk with me. I mean, I need people to help me to grow spiritually. Colossians says, just as you received Jesus Christ the Lord, so walk in Him. That's why at Gateway Church, we always talk about the fact that we're on a spiritual journey. And that we're not asking you to start where you're not, we're asking you to start where you are. And it's okay that you're here and you're here and you're here and you're here. We believe that you're here to take another step. That's why that's our slogan. That's what we are all about as a church, helping people take a step in the right direction. We call that the spiritual life, the Christian walk or the Christian journey. And that's what Gateway is all about, uh, creating an environment where you can take the next right step for you, a step of faith, a step of wisdom, a step of trust, a step into the light, a step out of the darkness, a step from confusion, a step into understanding. And one of the key ways that God tells us to do this is to understand that you were never meant to walk through life alone. And this has nothing to do, by the way, this has nothing to do with whether you're married or single. I can tell you, we have lots of singles here in this room that are experiencing wonderful community, even though they are not married. And we have other married couples in the church who are desperately lonely. It has nothing to do but your marital status. Marriage does not solve the issue. Community solves the issue. Well, some of you say, well, Rick, well, what's wrong with walking alone? I, I like walking alone. In fact, I like kind of not having to depend on somebody because if I depend on somebody, then they're going to let me down. I'm actually, what you're talking about is setting myself up for failure. Hurt. Betrayal. Tears. Uh-huh. That happens. That can but there's an old Zambian proverb that says, when you run alone, you run fast. But when you run together, you run far. Hey, folks, life is not a dress rehearsal. This is the real thing. Do you want to run fast or do you want to run far? Do you want to just get there as fast as you can? Or do you want to do what you need to do and do it right? Do you want to come to the end of your life and say, I am better because I journeyed and walked with these people whom I dearly, dearly love and dearly love me? When God built the earth, when God created all in Genesis, it says that, you know, he, he made the heavens and the earth, and he says that was good. And he created the stars in the sky, and that was good. And he made the sun in the place, and the moon in his place, and he said that was good. And he, he made the water and the land, and that was good. And he, you know, and then he put animals and, 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 and trees and vegetation in the, in the world, and he said that was good. And then he made Adam, and he went, eh, not so much. <laughs> not that there's nothing wrong with Adam, but he said, Adam being alone. That's not good. It's not good for man to be alone. It's not good for us to be alone. God hates loneliness. The Godhead is a communal trinity of three. Nothing in creation was ever created in isolation. Community is God's answer to loneliness. And we are here today to learn what it means to practice love. You can't learn community without being in community. And that's why we're inviting everybody to get into some measure, some expression of community that is greater than just you yourself. And that's why for the next six weeks, I want to encourage you, whether it be breakfasts or coffees or Starbucks or whether it be, you know, a lunch or whether it be in your home, somehow would you get into something, some form of group, whether it be three or four or five or ten, whatever, and begin to talk about some of these things that we're going to cover over the course of Sunday. We've got all kinds of materials for you to use. And to create an opportunity for you to come to grips with the fact that you are better together than you are on your own. So I need others to walk with me. I also need others to work with me. You were put on this earth to do a good work. That's what Ephesians says. God made us to do good works, which he planned in advance for us to do. 
Before you were ever born, God decided what talents he was going to give you and what, what abilities, what natural abilities, he desires. He, he knew who, who you would be born to, your parents, and, and, and how you would be born and what your life was like. And anytime you use your gifts, your talents, your abilities, your gifts, whenever you use those the way God wired you to help others, you are doing good works. Now, many of us will say, well, Pastor, I'm just so busy. I'm worn out. You want me to get more involved? You want me to commit to another group? You want me to do more stuff? I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I'm burned out. And I can tell you why. If you're tired and you're burned out or exhausted, there's only a couple of reasons. One, you're trying to do too much. And number two, you're trying to do it by yourself. The only reason why you're tired and burnt, when you say, oh, I'm just so tired and burnt out, I got time for friends, and I got time to get involved in this, and I don't have time to, to help the poor or help those who are going through struggle, I don't have time to volunteer the church. There's only two reasons. You're doing too much, and you're doing it by yourself. Because when I do something that is, it is, that is kingdom building, when I do something that is life giving, when I do something, when I'm in partnership with others, it is not exhausting, it's energizing. It is energizing. It, it creates strength. It creates enthusiasm. When you do something together with somebody and you do something that is bigger and better than yourself, it will give you life. It will give you energy. It will give you strength. And God has called Gateway as a church to serve. It's in the fabric of who we are. Snowflakes are frail, but if you stick enough of them together, they can stop traffic. It's hopefully not this weekend. Community is God's answer to fatigue. I'm too tired. You're too tired because you're doing too much and you're doing it by yourself. But you do something that is kingdom building and you do it with others, it will not tire you out. It will encourage you and strengthen you. I need people to walk with me in my life. I need people to work with me through life. I also need others to watch out for me in life. I'm talking about the people who will defend you, who will stand up for you who will keep me on track, who will watch my backside and kick me in the backside when I need it. And we need it because we all have blind spots. We all have parts of our lives that we're blind to. And Paul said in Philippians, look out for another's interests, not just for your own interests. Have you ever been in a neighborhood and you see those signs, neighborhood watch? Those neighborhood watch signs? That's a sign of community. That's a sign that lets everybody who's on the outside coming into this community that says to everyone around, we look out for each other. Now, many, many of you are planning a vacation this summer. And you go on your vacation and you'll go away and you'll lock the door, but you're probably going to go to a neighbor or somebody in your life and you'll say, while I'm God, will you keep an eye on the house? In other words, will you watch out for my stuff? My question today is not, is anybody watching out for your stuff? My question today, is anybody watching out for your soul? Is anybody watching out for your soul? Do you have a, a neighborhood watch, a community watch around your life so that you have those in your life who can see your blind spots, who can keep you from trouble? Is there anybody in your life says, I'm going to not let you drop out? I have people all the time that say, well, you know what? I've got this church and my church is great and I come here on Sundays and I, you know what? I come here once a week and I get my Jesus on and then I go back and I live my life and then all of a sudden my world falls apart and I, something goes wrong in my life and I, I get a hurt. I get a little bitterness. I get a little wound. Something's gone wrong and you know what? I don't feel like going to church today and so I start pulling back and the more I start pulling back, that bitterness just grows and that wound just gets a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger and then all of a sudden, you know what? Hey, it's been two or three weeks and ah, nobody's called. Nobody cares. And all of a sudden you're like, ah, I guess it doesn't matter. You just drop out. And then when somebody says, hey, I noticed so-and-so is not around here. And then you're oh, the church, they just wrote me off. They, they didn't care. They, where were they when I needed them? You don't have a neighborhood watch on your soul. You have to invite this in to your life and say, hey, when I have a problem, when I'm gone when I get hurt, keep an eye on my soul. Keep an eye on my pain. Keep an eye on my tears. Keep an eye on my tough time because I don't know that I can make it on my own without you. When sin trips me up and, and I fall on my face, where are my friends then that will gather? Not condemn me. I already condemning myself. I need somebody who will love me and restore me. I don't have to be, I don't have time to be in a small group, you say. Well, okay. And besides, small group intimacy, it's a little creepy. <laughs> yeah, it is a little creepy. It is a little risky. It is a little messy. It's a little awkward. And it doesn't always work until someone gets cancer, until you lose your job, 
until your wife looks at you and says, you can't come home. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you can't get enough community. All enough, all of a sudden then, you, you just can't enough. And you're wondering, where am I going to get the support and help? Hebrews 13 says, keep being concerned about each other as the Lord's followers should. We should care for one another because we're family. We're part of God's family. And did you know that you have an enemy that is more destructive than any terrorist? You have a personal enemy today, and sometimes we don't talk about this enough in the church, but you have an enemy, and his name is Satan, and he wants to mess up your life. And every day, his number one agenda is to mess with your life. He wants to steal and kill and to destroy. He wants to ruin your relationship, destroy your hopes and dreams, and kill everything that you hold to be valuable. And every single day, God has given you weapons to stand against the attack of the enemy. But I can tell you this, and I'm not going to get into all of them, but I'll tell you this. One of the most important weapons against the enemy of your soul is the church, Amen. the community, yeah. your friends and believers. One of the greatest tools and weapons you have against the enemy who wants to destroy you is your community. It says a person standing alone can be a de facto or a defeated, it says in Corinthians, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. That's your group. That's your group of friends. So here's my question. Is there anybody watching your back? Is there anybody kicking your backside? Is there anybody watching out for your spiritual warfare? Do you have anybody in your life who will be there for you in the tough times? I mean, you know. You know that you know that you know. They will be there for you. Why? Because you were there for them. Community is God's answer to defeat. And when one person falls, we gather around and we pick them up. Yeah. So I need those to walk with me. I need those to work with me. I need those to, to uh, encourage me. I need those to weep and to wait with me. To wait and to weep. I'm talking about those moments in life when you're waiting for the bad news. That will weep when the bad news comes. I need people with me in that inevitable crisis of life when tragedy hits. And there are situations that nobody ever should have to go through alone. One thing I know about life, there's going to be some bad stuff that's going to happen to you. It's inevitable. You're going to have loved ones who die. You're going to get bad news. There will be tragedies. There'll be bad health news. Only a fool would go through life knowing that there will be tragedies, knowing that there will be difficulties, knowing that there will be troubles, and while things are good, not get ready. Only a fool would recognize that there will be a day come when I need everybody to surround me, and now while things are good, that you don't take the time to create a network of people that will die for you, that will care for you to create a safety net and a support of friendship that is so deep, that is so strong, that as Corinthians says, when one suffers, we all suffer. Community is God's answer to despair. And when you're despairing, when your world has fallen apart, I can tell you that's when you're going to want to have people around you that care for you. Last, I need others to witness with me, to be a witness with me. You see, you have a life message that God wants you to share with the world. It's part of your message, mission. It's part of my mission. And the greatest voice that we have as the church is when we speak together love to our neighbors, when we demonstrate love to our community. Now, interesting thing. Jesus said this in John chapter 13. I'm going to say it to you in a way that you may have never heard it before. Jesus said, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. I'm going to say it again. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Now, what's missing? Jesus did not say, your love for me will prove to the world that you love me. Jesus did not say, your love for God will tell the whole world that you love God. In fact, God doesn't care. That's not the whole point. God knows you love him. You don't need to FYI him. God doesn't want you to know that you love him. He knows you love him. He wants the world to know that you love him. And he said the only way for them to know that you love him is for you to love them. That's really good. That's good. He didn't say, 
You know what? You will know, they will know that you love God when you keep the rules. He, you will know, they will know that you love God when you don't drink, don't smoke, don't dance. He didn't say that. He didn't say they will know that you love him when, you know what, when you do all of these things that the church expects you to do. No, no, no. He didn't say that. He said, your love for one another will prove to the world that you're my disciples. Right. Hear me now. The world doesn't care if you love Jesus if you don't love them first. They don't care. Hey, I want you to know I love Jesus. So what? The church stands around and says, hey, we're a church that loves Jesus. And the world goes, yes, so? They don't care that we love Jesus. What they want to know is does the love of Jesus is in you make you want to love them? That's what they want to know. Right. And the world doesn't care if you love God if you don't love the least of this world. So we get a lot to talk about in the weeks to come, don't we? What impresses the community the most? Love. That's what impresses them. That's what we want Gateway to be known for. We don't want to impress them with the size or the beauty of our buildings or the sermons or the music and the youth and the programs and all those things. That's not what we want to impress people with. We want to impress people with our love. Hey, you know what? You need love? You want to go to Gateway because Gateway is where you're going to be loved. Hey, you're going through a difficult time? You want to go to Gateway because Gateway is where you're going to be helped. Where Gateway is where you're going to get accepted. Gateway is where you're going to come and get a great big hug. God's answer to fear is community. We are working together, struggling side by side to show others the good news that God loves them. And they will know that God loves them. Say it, when we love them. So we all need each other. We all need each other and they need us. We need believers to walk with us and to work with us, to watch over us, to weep with us and wait with us. And you can't do this life on your own. At least you can't do it well. And you're certainly not going to do it right. And community doesn't just happen. It's risky. It's messy. It's awkward. It's uncomfortable. And the greatest presumption of all humankind is to think that because your Facebook is full of friends that you actually have some. You don't. Life is not a bunch of smiley emoticons. And we cannot experience community until we're actually in community. Amen? It's going to be a fun six weeks. Father, I just pray for everyone that is here today. It's time for the church to be the church. For us to be known for no other things other than our love. If they know that we love them, we prove that we love you. And it begins in our hearts. Because, Lord, we don't always love everybody. And we have hang-ups. And we have struggles. So if we can't love in here, we're not going to well, love well out there. So, Lord, here's the place to practice. Here's the place where we love. And we love where? Lord, we want to love at the table. We want to love at your table. We want to gather together and experience your love at the tables in our homes, in our lives. People that will have our back. Those who will kick us when we need it. Those who will love on us when we're discouraged. Those who will journey with us, walk with us, with long suffering. And though we mess it up, we get back up. We mess it up and we get back up. We mess it up and we get back up. But we don't get back up alone. We get back up with those who are with us. And I understand that for some of you here saying, you know what, I, I, I want this. This resonates. I don't have this. If that's you today, it's real simple. All you have to do I say, God, I don't understand all of this. I just know what I don't have. Just tell them that. But I do want what I've heard today. So come into my life. 
The stuff I don't get, I just leave with you. The stuff I do get, that's what I want. That's all it takes. Lord, forgive me. I'm here. Take me the good, the bad, and the ugly for what I am. And the rest, you and I will figure it out one step at a time. But I need to walk with somebody, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope you all prayed that prayer. I hope to every degree you all understand. None of us have this figured out. That's why we're the church. We're learning together. We're walking together. We're working together. And together, we'll love on one another even better. Amen? Amen. Before we leave, we're going to have a couple of questions that I just want you to take just three minutes. Just three minutes. Because again, I want to encourage you to have some transparent conversations. So with the people that you're around, just a couple of questions. One, based on everything that you've heard today, what do you need others for most? What is it you need? You don't have if you don't ask. So what is it you need most? And this week, I'm not asking you to run a race. What's one step? What's one thing you can do this week to enrich your life in community? We'll be back in just a few minutes. We're glad that you are enjoying some good conversation together, and uh, thank you for being here today. We really hope it's been meaningful and beneficial to you in many ways. So you've heard what you heard. As you go today, what is your next step? I hope that you've been able to identify it, and you can begin to take that step this week. Next week, we invite you to come early and hang out in our atrium cafe before the service and uh, spend a little time before you come into the service if you are coming to the second one we also encourage you to invite someone with you to come with you uh, for the service and uh, we hope that that is something that uh, you can feel that you can do during this series before you leave today we do appreciate you being able to help us to stack the chairs 10 high and move them to the side of the room uh, except for 50 chairs right here front and center for our music team uh, as we are going to have a rehearsal today have a great week and we'll see you soon.